Um, we do a class series on teaching people the basics of Christianity. So in the booklet that we use uh, is the study on the cross. And I just want to explain why I've done it a little bit different today. The purpose of a basic study series is that, is to teach the basics. So if you're a young Christian, you want to study the Bible with one of your friends, what I'm about to do may be a little bit overwhelming because your knowledge is not so great. So we use Matthew um, and we go through the actual actions. I'm using Mark today. There is a medical account that you can read out that helps people connect with it and then some scriptures that apply it to what you've learned. This is a fantastic way as a young Christian to go, look, I really want to convey my feelings about Christianity, about the cross to somebody, but I, I'm not used to doing that. I'm not used to studying the Bible. So this is excellent for a young Christian to go, okay, I can communicate all I want to by using these different tools. But like the booklet says, this is first principles, okay? This is for young Christians, okay? That's not for us mature Christians who really should be far more in, in tune with the Bible and what it speaks about. And the cross is a very, very personal thing to us and is the difference why we do what we do. So for me, I use Mark and I don't use a medical account because I want to express to people exactly what, what I feel about Jesus and the cross, okay? Because most people we study the Bible with are one of two types of people. Either God has opened them up and literally we're filling in the gaps and they're going, I've always wanted to be a Christian. I know this is what I want to do. And literally it's very easy to study the Bible with them. The other type are those that sort of know it, they should do it, but don't want to do it. I was in this category. So you've studied the Bible with them and you've gone, okay, yes, I need to do that. And I need to give up my sin and I need to do that. Do you want to do it? Not really but I know I need to do it. So what is the difference? How do you help somebody going from, I know I need to do it, to I really want to do it, okay? That's what the study, the cross, is all about. Not only that, as a Christian, there are many times that you don't want to be a Christian, but you know that's not right. So what do we always go back to? We go back to the cross which is why we take communion every Sunday to remember an aspect of the cross. So I'm actually going to start the study and I'm going to treat you all as the person I'm studying the Bible with, okay, to make it more personal rather than going the teddy bear or Fred or uh, I'm going to try and convert all of you to a soft heart by the end of the sermon. Is that okay? All right. So we're going to start in Mark, Mark 14. Basically, we're going to study the cross today. Unfortunately, in Christianity, the cross is something that people don't connect with. They don't understand. There's a, a cross up there, but people go, I know it's the Christian symbol, but I don't really get what it's all about. It's a very serious study we're doing, an emotional study, looking at the physical and the emotional and the spiritual suffering of Jesus as he went to the cross and why he did it. So we're going to pick up in Mark chapter 14, verse 27. Here is where Jesus predicts Peter, who is his right-hand guy's denial. Jesus says, you will all fall away, Jesus told them. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. The truth of it is that most of us, if not all of us, don't realize how tough Christianity is. Peter here had followed Jesus and basically he was in for the good times, man. I'm, I'm Peter. I'm his right hand guy, man. With Jesus, I walk on water. I mean, I literally walk on water. There's miracles. It's awesome. We go hungry. He just orders a McDonald's out of thin air, feeds 5,000 people. Following Jesus is incredible. And then Jesus goes, no, 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 no. You're all going to leave me. And Peter's like, what? You've got to be nuts. I'm not leaving you. I mean, you the source of joy, miracles, wonder. There's no way. And everybody else went, yeah, we'll never leave you. And yet, sadly, so many people leave God, even within the first year of being converted, for this very same reason. They do not understand 
just how much you need to sacrifice for the privilege of being saved and going to heaven. We carry on in verse 32. It says, They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, man, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? That's why I pray for an hour a day. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Once more, he went away and prayed the same thing. When he came back, he found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. Returning the third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hand of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. You know, why was it that the disciples were so fired up and Jesus was so depressed, deeply sorrow? I mean, this was a deep, dark moment of depression that he was tempted with because he knew he was going to be crucified. Somehow, a lot of us get in our mindset that Jesus wanted to go to the cross. Nobody wants to be crucified. He was like, God, come on, man. Take this away from me. Surely there's another way to save people that go through the cross. And that's what it's like for so many of us. I want to be a Christian, but I don't want to dot, 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 dot. Yeah. You know, have you ever felt sad or overwhelmed? Personally, I've struggled with depression most of my life. I was left home at eight and a half. And as a result of not feeling loved, I knew intellectually my family loved me, but I didn't feel loved. And so I've sat in many dark rooms, many times, feeling depressed. However, I have never got to the point where I thought, man, it says overwhelm the sorrow to the point of killing himself, like death. There's almost this feeling of, maybe I could just die before I get crucified. You know, Jesus knew what he ought to do and yet didn't want to do it. And yet, what was the solution? We find him praying. The difference between those people that make it to heaven and those people that don't is prayer. He said, God, change my heart. There are so many times as a Christian, I have wanted to just not do it. And I've had to go, you know what? I'm going out of my house and I'm not coming back until my heart has changed through prayer. And why do I always talk about praying for an hour? If Jesus, it says he went away, prayed for an hour, and he said to his disciples, can't you even pray for an hour? Can't you keep awake? Here I am dying over here. You can't even do it for an hour. And then what did he do? Well, he saw how weak they were. He went back to pray for them more. And then again. You know, he went from what? I don't want to go to rise, let's go. There was this resolute, I'm going to do it now. That's what prayer does to people. And yet, how did Jesus feel being let down by his friends? You know, if I think about the things that motivate me and the things that demotivate me, being let down is one of the things that really demotivates me. You know, if I arrange to meet somebody, a friend, and they don't turn up and they don't call me, I don't want to call them. I'm like, I'm hurt. I'm disappointed. Have you ever felt that? I felt that a lot in my life. So did the actions of these people that he had poured his life into for three years motivate him to want to go to the cross? Absolutely not. You know, I would say I've been hurt more by disciples, by Christians, than I have non-Christians. Because my expectation of them has been higher. And yet we see that Jesus went, I'm going to go and pray for them because they're weak, as opposed to being bitter and using it as an excuse 
to not do what God wants me to do. And yet, why was he doing this? Why did Jesus do this? He did, didn't make him any more perfect. It didn't mean that he wasn't going back to heaven. He could have just gone, forget this. I'm just going back to heaven. It's because he loved us. It's because of our sin. Jesus knew that if he didn't give us the chance to become Christians, we would never be able to change. I would have been stuck sleeping with women and having abortions, becoming a murderer. I would have been stuck addicted to smoking. I would have been stuck in my depression. I would have been stuck like so many people. I needed somebody to love me and going, I will be there for you. That's why he was doing it. It goes on in verse 43. It says, just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared. With him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests and teachers of the law and the elders. Now the betrayer has arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, and kissed him. The men seized Jesus and arrested him. Then one of those standing near drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Am I leading a rebellion, said Jesus, that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I was with you teaching in the temple courts, and you did not arrest me. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. Then everyone deserted him and fled. A young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus. And when they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment. You know, be honest. How would you feel if Jeremy turned up to your house next week with all of his work colleagues and he'd met you in church, 30 work colleagues with knives and guns to come and kill you? You would have felt terrified, confused. And then imagine Jeremy was actually your best friend in the church. And he opened the door and he kissed you and said, I've got a present for you. And then they pushed past him and started beating you up and roughly handing you and dragging you off into the middle of the streets. You know, there's one thing about being betrayed, but being betrayed with a kiss, that's like a knife going into their heart. And yet, who was Judas? Jesus had loved Judas so completely that when he said, one of you will betray me, nobody knew it was Judas. Because Jesus' love for him had been that perfect. You know, have you ever been betrayed? So often feelings of betrayal are literally you gave your heart to someone. Maybe you gave your heart to a woman or a man and they broke your heart. And you felt, man, I, I gave my virginity to you. I, I gave my, my life to you. And then you, this is what you did for me? Some of us have much deeper cuts than that. We've given our hearts to our parents or our uncle and we've been sexually abused. I mean, we have been betrayed. And yet Jesus, instead of it demotivating him, he went, you know what? For all those people out there that are inclined to betray people, if I don't die for them, they will remain betrayers their whole of their life. They will betray their wives and their husbands. They will be adulterous. They will leave their kids when it gets tough and they will betray their responsibility. I need to be the example. I need to love them and show them what true love is, that when pain is the alternative, you can embrace it and you can succeed. You know, what could he have done? Well, in Matthew it says he could have called down a legion of angels. He could have gone, man, just legions of angels, just come on here, take care of these guys. But you see, the easy way out doesn't accomplish what we want. When I studied the Bible, the biggest thing, the biggest thing that convicted me was I had always run away when the pain had got tough. When it had got tough, I was a quitter. Now, I had a high threshold, so most people didn't see that. But you know what? If a relationship got too sticky, we finished, rather than push it on through. If there was an argument, you know what, I wouldn't resolve it. If I felt hurt or betrayed, I, I just not call that person back. Why? Because I was a quitter. And yet, when I look at Jesus, there is nobody that is more heroic to me than Jesus. That's why I'm a Christian. 
you cannot tempt me to follow you because you are not as impressive as Jesus. Carried on in Mark uh, 14, 53. Says they took Jesus to the high priest and all the chief priests, elders and teach the Lord came together. Peter followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. There he sat with guards and warmed himself at the fire. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. But they did not find any. Many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. Then some stood up and gave false testimony against him. We heard him say, I will destroy this man-made temple and in three days build another not made by man. Yet even then their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses? He asked. But you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. Then some began to spit at him. They blindfolded him, struck him with their fists and said, prophesy. And the guards took him and beat him. Here Jesus knows that in order to save man, he needs to go to the cross. Who's he doing it for? Well, you know what? Maybe we can be motivated by sticking at Christianity, sacrificing for our friends. But then his friends let him down. He's like, oh, but I'll still do it. Then he gets brought between the most religious, the most spiritual human beings on the planet. On the planet. These guys were meant to be the representation of God's love on earth. The wisest, the kindest, the most spiritual. And what were they doing? They created a kangaroo court. Well, what did, what's in it Jesus done? Nothing. And they made up lies, one after the other, because they were jealous. And imagine being in that court. And they, they're getting these people to lie about him. And Jesus says, he's like, there's no point arguing. I'm not going to say anything. Because the truth of it is, whatever I say, if they're willing to lie, they're just going to refute it. And he was there and he, they were like looking at him and imagine they go, okay, what's the verdict? Kill him, beat him, crucify him, kill him. And then it says they begin to spit at him. I don't know about you, but growing up, there were two things you didn't do on the school schoolyard unless you wanted a fight. One was insult my mother and one was spit at me. There is something about being spat on that is just so offensive. And yet Jesus did not react. And then the coward said, let's blindfold him. Why? I think they were terrified to look into his eyes. I think they were terrified to go, man, there is nothing that is going to move this man to sin. And then it says they beat him. The cowardly so-called spiritual leaders of the world spat on him, blindfolded him, only hit him when he couldn't look back. Let me ask you, if you were Jesus, would you have died for the world? I wouldn't. Your friends let you down, your parents think you were crazy, and the most spiritual people that are meant to be your examples are wicked, evil cowards. And yet, why did he do it? Because he loved us. Even if I was the only human being that actually became a Christian, Jesus would still have died for me to give me hope of changing the world. That's why. We read on. It says, while Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You were also with that Nazarene Jesus, she said, but he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said, and went out into the entryway. When the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around, this fellow is one of them. Again, he denied it. 
After a little while, those standing near said to Peter, Surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. He began to call down curses on himself, and he swore to them, I don't know this man you're talking about. Immediately the rooster crowed a second time. Then Peter remembered the words Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down and wept. You know, when Peter was asked if he knew Jesus, he was like, I don't know him. Not my friend. And yet, in Luke 22, it says that Jesus looked at Peter across the courtyard and Peter saw his eyes and broke down into tears. His best friend was so pathetic and weak, he was fearful of death for the Savior. That's us. That's us. It's too hard. Let me tell you, you live in Australia, Christianity is not hard. It's not hard. If we ever say that, we need to be ashamed of ourselves. Oh, it gets difficult. But we are not in India. We are not in Russia where it's illegal to be a Christian. We are not in any of those countries. And yet Jesus knew how weak we can be. And he said, you know what? I need to die on the cross so that these guys can be saved, can get the Holy Spirit so they have the strength not to be that weak. Without him going to the cross, there would have been no indwelling Holy Spirit. It was because he loved us that he died on the cross. Carry on in Mark 15, verse 1. It says, Very early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders to teach the law and the whole Sanhedrin reached a decision. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Are you the king of the Jews? Pilate asked. Yes, it's as you say, Jesus replied. The chief priests accused him of many things. So again, Pilate asked him, aren't you going to answer? See how many things they are accusing you of. But Jesus still made no reply, and Pilate was amazed. Now it was a custom of the feast to release a prisoner whom the people requested. A man called Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the uprising. The crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did. Do you want me to release you, the king of the Jews, asked Pilate, knowing it was out of envy that the chief priest had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have Pilate released Barabbas instead. What shall I do then with the one you call king of the Jews, Pilate asked him. Crucify him, they shouted. Why, what crime has he committed, asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them and he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Jesus here has committed no crime. Pilate, being the coward that he is, wants to figure a way to get out of it and not take responsibility. You know, I've met people whose names are Jesus. I've met people whose names are even Judas and Barabbas. I have never met anybody called Pilate. Because Pilate represents, I'm not going to make a decision for Jesus, and I'm not going to make one against Jesus. But if you don't become a Christian or you leave God, that is against Jesus. Pilate was even warned by his wife, have nothing to do with this man. God is kind, and yet he was a coward. He didn't want to upset his work colleagues, possibly the emperor. He didn't have the courage. And yet Jesus was like the X Factor. Okay, this week we've got Jesus over here, done nothing wrong, few miracles, really good guy, and we've got Barabbas, killed a lot of you guys. Stabbed you in the back, literally. Killed some soldiers. Come on, which one do you want? Jesus, yeah, Jesus. Barabbas? Where were all the people that Jesus healed? Where were all the lepers? Where was Lazarus and Mary and Martha? Where was the woman who had a son raised? Where were all the people that personally gained from Jesus healing them? You know what, I can take a lot. You know, and even when religious people persecute us, it doesn't bother me that much. I'm like, you really don't know what you're doing. But if it's one thing that really demotivates me in life, it's ingratitude. 
It's really ingratitude. You know, if somebody comes and meets me and goes, hey, buy me a coffee, I don't want to now. I'm like, now I don't, I was just about, I don't want to. I've got no problem being generous or helping people. But when they're ingrateful, I'm like, forget it. That's my heart. But I see in Jesus, he's going, you know what? They don't understand. And yes, those people may be ungrateful. And yes, maybe those people that I've healed don't appreciate me. But I have hope that there are some people that I die for that will appreciate me, that will stand up for me, that will love me the way that I have loved them. Why did Jesus go through the pain? Why was he willing not to say anything? Without the crucifixion, there would be no forgiveness. There would be no fresh start. There would be no church. There would be no love. There would be no hope. Because great hope is built on great sacrifice. We carry on. It says that they took him out and they had him flogged and handed him over to crucify. You know, when it talks about flogging, again, I think we don't really have an idea. And actually, I think most of the movies we watch don't do it horrific justice. It was basically a cat and nine tails which was a whip which had bits of leather in it that would have bits of stone, bits of bone, and you were going to be flogged 39 times. The law said you couldn't be flogged 40. So the religious leaders had created this system where, look, let us try and kill him through being flogged, which, hey, we don't have any responsibility for because we're allowed to do it, and we'll kill him but we won't accept the blame because, hey, we're allowed to do that to a blasphemer. You see, wicked hearts always figure out wicked schemes. And it would have ripped across his back and his flesh. And if you don't know, but most of your back is really soft flesh. So your buttocks, it would rip out of the buttocks. Excrement would literally flow out of your body. You would expose your hamstrings. It would rip around to your fat around here, pull that off. It would go literally, not only rip the skin out of your ribs, it would go into your ribs, pull out some of the, the sinew from there. It would literally shred your face to bits. Bits would get in your eye. It would possibly pop your eyeballs. This was the pain that Jesus went through. When people try and tempt me with not being a Christian, I said, what do you got to offer? Even my own parents. Yeah, I appreciate you have loved and sacrificed me, but your love does not compare to the pain that Jesus went through. At every lash, he could have gone, enough, I'm out of here. I'm going back to heaven. They're not worth it. They're simply not worth it. Imagine the, the thought pattern and say, God, go on, tell me one who's worth it. Peter, he's just denied me. Judas, he denied me. John, he's denied me. My parents don't care. The religious people of this world don't care. The soldiers don't care. The people I healed, they don't care. Give me a reason to continue. And yet somewhere in his heart, he said, if I don't do it, no one has the hope of change. We're going to be thrown over to atheism, materialism, communism, Catholicism, false doctrine. That's our greatest hope. And all of them, literally genocide thousands. That's why I'm a Christian. That's why I fight for it. It says they take him out to be flogged in Mark 15 verse 16. It says, the soldiers led Jesus away to the palace, that is the praetorium, and called together a whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, they twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, hail king of the Jews. Again and again, they struck him on the head with a staff and spat on him. Falling to their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off his purple robe and put his own clothes on him and they led him out to crucify him. You know, many times in my life, I've been mocked, many times. Some for my own stupidity, having a Mohican and looking a bit weird, but nothing like this. But I tell you, if it's one thing that stirs anger, 
it's insult. Many of us have children, they've insulted us more than we can imagine. Many of us have parents that have insulted us, friends, we have been the insulters. There is something about being insulted. Not even physically, sometimes physically it's harder to separate it because you go, this will go away. But when somebody starts to attack your personal character, inside us there is this feeling of, that is wrong, this is unjust. I am perfect. I have done nothing wrong. And you are mocking me? If ever I think Jesus was tempted to just get up and call down fire to just obliterate mankind, I think it was at this moment. And yet what does he say? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And it says they took him out to crucify him. Verse 21 says, a certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander Rufus, was passing by on the way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgatha, which means place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. It was the third hour when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, King of the Jews. They crucified two robbers with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days? Come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teacher of the law mocked him amongst themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Christ, King of Israel, come down from the cross that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults at him. You know, they came to gloat. Jesus wasn't even strong enough to actually lift the beam that he needed. You know, do you know how somebody dies when they're crucified? We see all of these things about, you know, they're being crucified and put through here. Basically, crucifixion was created to be the most excruciating way to die in existence. That was its whole purpose. You would be nailed to a cross, some say just a, literally a single piece of wood. But the way you would die is you would actually suffocate because you literally have to pull yourself up and breathe by pulling yourself up on your bone and pushing yourself on your feet. And you get to the point where you are caught between, I need to breathe, but I can't do it because of the pain. And in the end, you are exhausted and you actually suffocate as if you are drowning. Why on earth would a man who could at any moment go, forget this, bother to do that? And as if the temptation was not enough, you have people on his left, on his right, real sinners, robbers, mocking him. And yet even in that last hour, Jesus' focus was not on himself. He looked down on his mother and said, John, take care of my mother. And he even gave salvation to one of the thieves. You know, I struggle with evangelism sometimes. This takes it away. It gives me deep conviction. What do I justify lack of evangelism for? Rarely is it illness or a cold. It's just I don't want to. I just don't want to. I don't have to. Imagine if Jesus didn't have to. Didn't have to go to the cross. Didn't have to save us. I mean, none of us deserve it. And yet, catching up in verse 33, it says, At the sixth hour, darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lamech sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Here, Jesus experiences the ultimate pain. Jesus, throughout this whole time, has been able to pray in his mind, pray in his heart to God, may even pray out loud and go, God, help me through this, help me through this, help me through this. He's got his best friend there with him. He's got God Almighty urging him on. He can communicate. And we all know that what's it like. When we struggle with temptation, we can pray, God, help me through this. And he comes and he strengthens. Jesus has been with God since the beginning of time. And yet, 
because he bore our sins on himself at this moment, for the first time in his existence, he is separated and no longer has a relationship with God. For the first time in his existence, he experiences hopelessness. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, it says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Imagine feeling all the pain and all the guilt and all the shame for every sin that you have personally done in a short period of time. Imagine that. Clouds of darkness like you have never experienced. A heaviness on your soul that you would feel like would crush you. Now imagine feeling the shame and the pain of every pedophile, every genocide, every abuser, every pornography, every child rape on you. The shame, the guilt, that was the pain that fell on Jesus so that we might be saved. And Jesus could not pray to his Father and say, Father, help me. And that's what it means by his wounds. We are saved. When we are saved, our sin literally is taken from us and the pain is put on to Jesus to give us the freedom. Who's my best friend? Jesus. Why? That's why. Nobody comes close and nobody ever will. You know, there's a story, I've read it a couple of weeks ago, but it's appropriate. It says, God the Father and Jesus was looking down at the world. They saw all the suffering, loneliness and pain. They saw all the people. They saw you and me. And Jesus said, Father, how can we help them? I love them. What can I do? God said, son, you don't understand. They're not like us. But Jesus said, Father, I'll do anything for them as long as you are with me. God said, son, you don't understand. The only way to help them is if you go down to the earth yourself. You'll have to live like a man, eat like a man, get dirty and tired and sick like a man. Jesus said, Father, I love them. I'll do anything as long as you are with me. God said, son, you don't understand. The people will laugh at you and reject you. Your own family will think you are crazy. Your followers will desert you in the end and you'll be all alone. But Jesus said, Father, look, I'll do anything as long as you're with me. God said, son, you don't understand. The people will falsely accuse you. They'll beat you. They'll spit on you. They'll flog on you. They'll na nail your bleeding naked body to the cross and you will die painfully like a criminal. Jesus said, Father, I love them. I'll do anything as long as you are with me. But God said, son, you do not understand. As you hang on the cross in agony, you will bear the sins of the world. You will feel their guilt, their shame, their pain, and their sins will separate you from me. In your greatest hour of need, I will not be with you. And Jesus looked at his father and said, now I understand, I will go. Do you see how much Jesus loves us? You know, in its entirety, 1 Peter 2 verse 21 says, to this you, to this we were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, no deceit was found in his mouth. When they held God's insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you are like sheep going astray. But now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Why did Jesus suffer like us? To give us an example. When your Christian friend abuses you, when your non-Christian, when your parents tell you not to be a Christian, friends at college tempt you with this, he has, I've left you an example. Stay close to me, remember the motivation, and don't let them touch you. Don't let them drag you away. We have to understand that Jesus died just for us. It's not a global thing. If Jesus hadn't died, I, Joe Willis, could not be saved. 
That makes it personal. Even if I was the only one on the earth that responded, he would still have gone through it. This is where in the study I challenge people, are you willing to suffer for the privilege of being a Christian? From your daily life of having quiet times and evangelism and giving contribution and standing up against work, not putting studies above God, to literal suffering. From your family, giving up careers to go on mission teams, selling your worldly dreams to save just one more soul like the thief on the cross. Why did Jesus bear our sins? So that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. So many of us from a moral background, are we willing to die to sin? I never really wanted to smoke. I never really want to get drunk. Yeah, how about living for righteousness? How about going on a mission team? How about going in the ministry? How about giving it all up to save a few? No, I want to be saved and I want my worldly life. The epitome of selfishness and self-deceit. You don't see, Jesus would have made the greatest career manager ever. And finally in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 says, For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. What motivates a Christian, what should motivate a Christian, is that Christ's love compels me. Who do most people live for? Who have you lived for up to this point in your life? Let's be honest, it's you, because you're selfish. Who should you live for? For God. When we take the communion, this is what we're meant to be remembering. Every week, some aspect of the cross. Maybe I'm struggling with being a coward this week. I remember how Jesus was courageous. Maybe I'm struggling to get out of bed because I'm sick. Jesus denied himself. Maybe I'm struggling with prayer life. Jesus went out and prayed for others. That's the key. There's always lots of people to pray for. We go back to the cross and go, you know what? I, there are no excuses in my life. Jesus has taken them all away. If I've had a bad day, a bad week, let's get back up and get on fighting. And to God be the glory. Amen.